welcome to today's uh, Elemental webinar, where we're going to be talking about the role of digital twin technology in decarbonizing buildings. So digital twin technology gives users access to a digital representation of a real world system to create simulations that can predict how a product or process will perform. And this tech has real potential in optimizing building performance and reducing energy use. So in this session, we're going to be looking at its benefits for building owners and managers, as well as some practical examples from a variety of different settings. Uh, we've got a great panel here today featuring Mark Williams, who is the Managing Director at Digital Engineering Consultancy, DO. We've got Michael McCoughlin, who is the Digital Lead at Social Housing Charity, Hacked. And we've got Catherine Lovell, who is the Research Fellow in Energy Transitions at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex Business School. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got a few talking points to get us started today, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. So please put any questions you might have into the, the chat or the ask a question box below. We'll try to get to as many as we can before the end of the session at mm -hmm. two. So let's let's start with some basics. Uh, Catherine, you're doing a lot of work in the digital twinning sector. Can you give us a, a broad strokes overview of how this technology works and what its objectives are? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. So you captured it um, well in that introduction. A digital twinning really is um, an umbrella term. Um, so it captures a range of different technologies and different approaches that can be used um, within it. Um, but this sort of overarching idea is that you have a virtual replica of a physical asset or system that uses data from that system to provide um, a representation of it in operation. So there are kind of three key elements there. So one is a physical asset or system that exists or has the potential to exist. Um, the second is a digital or virtual model or representation. And then the third, which is what distinguishes it from um, sort of more conventional approaches to modeling um, is an idea of the data flows that um, sit between those two um, elements. And so within those three, um, areas there's obviously quite a lot of variation and the form and approach to digital twinning is very much going to be shaped by um, what what we do with it and the objectives that are associated with it and that's very much linked to the use case and we'll see we see a variety of those even within the built environment um, this is obviously a technology which is used elsewhere and um, is more recently being being brought into the built environment at speed Okay, great. Thank you. Michael, um, this technology must be pretty versatile then, considering it's being adopted in the social housing sector. And this is where a place where building stock is, is hugely varied. There are so many different variables around things like occupancy and geography and so on. Absolutely. Um, and and, and in fear of um, kind of repeating some of the things Catherine said, I, I do think that's pretty key to the use of it. Um, and I'd probably say to its future successes in the sector too. So I suppose digital twins is, is much about understanding the approach of turn data into the visual representation of, of the physical object uh, rather than purely the tools and technologies uh, you know go on to mention them throughout today uh, it's they're more the mechanism that, that makes that happen but i think you know understanding that the approach about is, is you know vastly about data as much as it's about technology and i mean i think having a range of choices around technology is important but certainly for hack and what we see in the housing sector is the most important thing around this is about the information um, and the data that, that underpins the whole approach and, and process of, of digital twins um, you know not only understanding the variables that you, know, you mentioned but um, how ultimately those different data sets interact together um, and ensuring that data underpins the use of technology and that makes it assured and consistent and, and with better quality um, i think the sector we've spoken about Kind of IT and digital transformation for you know the last 15, 20 years, and particularly the last couple of years, has really transformed because of, of um, you know, kind of pandemic and, and remote working. Um, and I think for us at Hacked, we talk about building data-driven organisations, um, and often the, the 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 work we do around digital transformation in the past is focused on technology, um, and really you might think about kind of without that, that I before T, really, you won't get that transformation. You won't be able to, you know, you may be able to use um, technology, but you'll never make it to drive the efficiencies that, that it would do um, otherwise. And I think it, it kind of led us to the work that we've done in the UK housing data standards, which um, maybe speak about later on, um, about building a, a kind of set foundation to your data to ensure that, that all technologies and, and innovation, particularly digital twins, which 
often organisations are using to make more um, safe, secure um, and, and better understood um, built environment um, are really built on foundations of, of kind of real safe, assured data. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think I think it's key, but I also think that there's, you know, technology is the the, the mechanism. But I would say that data is the real um, real driver behind this. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, Mark, in, in your experience in a DO, like what what range of industries and sectors have you seen adopting this technology, and is it progressing faster in some areas than others? Yeah. Um, well, we DO as a company, we work in two different worlds. Um, we work in the engineering space and we also work in the built environment space and we got um, dragged into the built environment world um, through our engineering experience of creating so a digital twin in, in respect to a, a product, you know, a, a phone. Um, it's all the information that goes around this phone and people like JLR and uh, big organisations have been doing um, data management of, of their products um, for, for years. Um, and we got asked to be part of um, a program back in 2015, um, which was Virtual Singapore. Um, Singapore were, uh, were literally digitizing the whole of their island um, for, for three three main reasons. One was for um, security, um, one for, was for um, evolution and planning, and then the other one was for decarbonization. But they wanted the digital twin of their build uh, of their island so they could understand um, how they were going to do things so we were involved in that from 2015 through to 2017 if you google it you'll see it's a huge project 750 billion dollars or something crazy numbers but um they went down to the point where they'd mapped out um things like you know um when uh, diff different foliage sort of fell um across the year so they could um re um plant um, different areas just so where um, they had uh, uh, foliage always green all the way around the, the, the seasons um, and decarbonisation. But um, that really opened our eyes to um, having uh, digital twins of properties, especially with their, they've got quite a lot of tall buildings. We then started to work with um, people like Carillion when they were around. Um, they were creating Europe's largest hospital um, in Birmingham. Uh, emergency hospital um so we were, we ran the digital twin element of that and um, and then we got involved in the housing association section because post grenfell um everybody was looking in, inward on themselves and going okay what does good look like how would we have fared on that day um and to have a digital twin to start building that um digital twin of their portfolio especially in their high-rise stock um was key to doing that um Dame Judith Hackett brought out her report um, and one of the, the key drivers was arm, arm the end user with information um, and she, she uh, challenged the, the golden thread of information about um, about a building. So specifically she was talking about uh, structural and, and, and fire safety but um, as, um, as, the, as the, the other two panellists have said, data is king. So having that 3D representation and starting to build on that um, moving forward um, is, is going to be key to that uh, to that journey and, and the decarbonisation journey. Um, and I think from our experience, people get scared. They go, wow, this is like trying to boil the sea. You know, it, it's, it's where do we start and where do we... And, uh, and we said, you know, finding the information you have already and then being able to bring that together is the good start. And then how we then take that into a 3D minority report world where you've got a hologram of the building and all that sort of stuff that's going to be way down the future uh, especially in this sector but for now um that, that journey needs to start okay great so let's let's actually talk about some of the things that this technology can do uh, for building managers and operators uh catherine let's let's talk about some of the potentials for things like cost savings and efficiencies Um, so as you've heard already, one of the, the key aspects of digital twinning really is it's, um, ways to collect, collate and update good data flows um, into a kind of a digital model um, or environment. Um, so one way of, of thinking about digital twinning then is, is um, not just as a data repository, but also as a potential learning platform and a tool for experimented, um, experimenting more quickly. Um, so where that's 
developed and applied for a building and operation, you've got the potential to spot patterns in the way um, a building is being used. Um, potentially, we can increase our understanding of different aspects of performance, like energy use. Um, and there's potential as well to start to catch um, problems as they um, develop, sort of find them at early warning signs um, for, for problems that, that can happen. Um, so thinking in terms of um, decarbonisation, there's the potential for that kind of first step of helping and understanding um, how energy is used within within the building and that kind of efficiency step. It's perhaps a slightly different way of using digital twins than if you if you pull out and start to look at the longer term and how um, buildings develop, which is perhaps the, you know, the, the next step um, along the road. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Mark, you mentioned a few case studies that you've been working on, but could you give um, some more sort of focused examples of, of spe uh, specific outcomes that digital twinning tech has resulted in? Um, <clears throat> well, in the um, <clears throat> what we're doing with Twinned at the moment, again, very focused on building safety, but then we're going to be building on um, for the IoT uh, integration to, to, to the decarbonisation decarbonisation arena um, but um, one of the key things to have a digital representation of the building and understand that building uh, and all the data that, that goes with it um, one of the key things that we wanted to do when we first started to work up uh, the, the Twindy platform was to give access not just to the organisation um, and the residents because that's key as well giving information to the residents so they understand their building um, but it was also to to give access to the fire service as well. Um, and back in April this year, uh, one of the buildings that we've created a, the initial digital twin of um, for um, one of the housing associations, um, unfortunately there was a fire on the 15th floor, um, but the fire service <coughs> had access to all that information. So they um, knew that, their command and control knew that on their system. They could go onto the uh, onto the system. They could uh, find all the floor plans, where the shutoff valves were, where all the uh, access points were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then from that, then um, help them tackle the fire. Um, so you know, okay, it's not decarbonisation, but it really helped in the uh, the instance of a fire. So everything that we set out initially to do, we'd 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 um, benchmarked really in an unfortunate way. Okay, great. Michael, uh, could you tell us how you've seen this technology being used in social housing settings? What kind of outcomes you've seen? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think, um, I'm just thinking, distilling that point down to, I think it's about enabling better planning and a lot of the things that, that, that come from the back of that. So we've seen, we've seen it used um, in terms of, of, you know, building that digital twin of, of asset data, really, um, Re reducing the cost of retrofitting or cyclical maintenance programs because you know um, sometimes we see data as king but actually you need to um, visually represent that to, to be able to see some of the um, nuances of it organizations often through no fault of their own but um, difficulties around different IT platforms and, 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 and internal capabilities and resources don't always have either the data or the space for the data on their systems and um, for spatial hierarchy for example um, and that causes problems when analyzing and interrogating data about particularly high-rise buildings where certain parts of the property are. Um, I know in, in terms of, of um, the, the golden thread of data, for example, that we talk about, um, you know, they may refer to rooms specifically, um, and I know in terms of, of fire safety and, and fire brigades looking for schemas of building where it says a bedroom, now that doesn't necessarily remain constant through the life cycle of that building and the bedroom could change into the living room. Now, if the fire brigade are told to go right into that room, actually, you know, that that's a far easier way to do it and say go to the bedroom, for example. So without visualising all of that data and without actually having a, an end point to that. So um, if you know what, what you need to the data, you need to require a digital twin um, it actually enables you to have a more a more resourced Kind of library of your your data assets again talking to, to, to mark's point from um, dame hackett and actually requiring a digital library of all um assets particularly for high-risk buildings and um, i think it's it, it's been key you know in in terms of that reducing the cost so i think what what we've seen it used operationally is um looking at various data sets and looking at either energy efficiency or um kind of repairs functions and saying 
actually, why is there more mould in that side of the building and, and not on that? And without being able to visualise that and actually put that often, I'm sure Mark will speak about this later on, having a bigger kind of digital twin, kind of digital city almost of that and, and, and be able to see what's happening around you. Um, you know, some of the things like why does um, um, mould or paint dry quicker in that side of the building? And that helps particularly large organisation and large cyclical maintenance programmes planning and a kind of larger, larger project. It also helps us understand um, energy efficiency of, of buildings, being able to see that um, and actually understand where their spatial hierarchy is in reference to other performance of other buildings. And if not, you know, the numbers on a spreadsheet that, that doesn't speak to us in the same way. And um, so seeing that, that work. In terms of our direct work, often we come almost a step before some of those outcomes and it's about that, that golden thread of information um, and you could kind of build the foundational steps for that to ensure that we do have the, the set definitions around um, kind of development handover and, and, and asset data to ensure that, that we do through the life cycle of that building and you know offshoot of that is the, the sustainability of that life cycle have a better understanding of what the data remains constant, what needs to be changed, and then what that has on that digital twin. So the digital twin doesn't represent what was in our planned document, but it's actually a live, living and breathing um, object that when components change of that, you know, we can see that visually um, and then can measure the, the performance um, on that. So I think, I think you know, the, the golden thread is a, is a real kind of pivotal point in this for housing associations. And it's really where this conversation moved from you know, a kind of aspirational digital twins seem like a, a great idea to actually, here's how we can use it operationally and here's how you know, we're beginning to do that as a sector. Great, thank you, Michael. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit now about using the technology in practice um, and, and how, how potential users of this tech who are, or who are on the call with you, you know, how I might actually get started with it. Um, Catherine, so we, we've discussed, you know, digital twinning tech can ostensibly be used in, in any building. Um, but are there some settings that stand to see more of a benefit from it than others? And are there any barriers or challenges that potential users should be mindful of if they're thinking about implementing this? Yeah, so I think we started to um, touch upon these um, already um, there. So if we're thinking about digital twinning as a tool for learning or developing um, environments, um, it sort of points us towards settings where there's a particular challenging um, environment or an unusual setting, um, something to be understood. Um, so that might be buildings where use patterns are expected to change um, over their over their lifetime. Um, it might be, um, as, as Mark was talking about, settings that are, are, are representative of, of wider challenges. So we might be talking about understanding crisis responses. Um, and so you can set up a digital twin um, with that in mind, that you're going to learn about how um, a building responses, responds and how people respond um, to it. Um, and also where um, you've got settings where you've got multiple uses and multiple users um, of, a, of an environment. So um, Michael just touched upon the communication potential um, for digital twins and how you can bring different actors together to respond to um, particularly visualizations um, of um, the data that's that's pulled together. Um, so those sort of environments where you've got a, a problem or a series of questions that you, you want to solve and, you've, and you foresee that sort of continuing over a longer period of time is maybe where it makes most sense to make that um, investment. In terms of challenges and barriers, I think we're already um, zeroing in on that um, around it's the quality, availability and appropriateness um, of data, both in terms of setting up a digital twinning um, environment in, in the first place, but also in thinking about how those data flows um, and the priorities of, of what you want to measure are, are likely to change over time. So there's a maintenance of, of data issue there as well. Okay. Mark, is, is this the kind of technology that building managers can use themselves? Do they require specialist services or platforms? Um, well, there, there needs to be a platform that brings all of this information together, but the, the key to all of it is making it easily understandable by the, the viewer. So mm. um, it's not um, you need a PhD in um, digital science to be able to understand what the digital twin is telling you. Um, what we what we've done is quite a lot of user groups and blah 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 to make sure that how we present things and that whole UI UX experience um, is key because you, you know, the whole 
if you, thought, if you think about the, the whole Steve Jobs analogy, don't worry how it works, it just works. Um, the viewer needs to be able to see the information about the building, how it how it's done in the background is is, is where the tech comes in, but um, the, uh, the user experience. Um, so I don't think, uh, uh, people sometimes think of um, digital twin, twins as BIM, um, you know, building information models, which are where you know, in, in the construction sector, that's the, the, the medium that they use um, to build up the construction, so they need to be, um, you know, a, a Jedi in uh, in being able to run a, a BIM piece of software. That's not the case. You know, a, a true digital twin should give you the access to the information that you need um, easily. Um, and then, and, and then, and then, um, as we said earlier, is understandably so you can then use that to analyse how buildings are going to operate and and, and work through time. Okay, Michael, let's talk about some of the the on the ground aspects of using this tech uh, things, for example, like the cost, how it's actually accessed, uh, the potential need for upskilling staff to use it. These these factors are going to be paramount for like cash and resource strapped sectors like the housing sector. So could you give us a little bit of insight here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and it's probably without you know putting too fine a point on it. One of the, the areas in which the sector probably need to do a bit more, and, and, and I don't necessarily mean about about being able to find the resources for that, because I think that, that um, the importance of it is you know, spoken about um, already, some of that, that actually is, it is key to not just um, how we're working just now, but how we'll work in future about um, you know, decarbonising buildings and, and ensuring kind of safety, particularly for the high-risk buildings. But I think it's about um, understanding costs and implications of that. So um, obviously there's an upfront cost about um, kind of building the, the um, digital twin environment um, and collecting that data and ensuring that that's uploaded um, and, and I certainly know Mark probably know more about that um, than, than I do but I think about then what the ongoing cost is and what your ongoing capabilities are and as you spoke about having that um, the, the staff kind of skills and Mark referred to kind of the BIM modelling so I think that's that all plays a part so having if you have staff who are skilled to that it will um, have a, a, a impact on how the ongoing cost of it <clears throat> in terms of managing the, the, the platform you use and updating the, the software as I say it's a you know you want a, a kind of living and breathing model and um, rather than a, a you know snapshot in time um, and I think I think that's key but I think for me it's about building the business case and um, often we talk at Hacked about um, you know you can have any technology in the world but unless you understand um, how um, your organization are going to work use it and um, how it applies to social housing tenants for example and um, particularly for, for the social housing sector um, and what tenant outcomes that that improves and um, i don't think you're ever going to make that business case purely just on, on financial terms it has to be something that not only increases organizational efficiency but you know it has that real understanding of the health and well-being and, and safety of tenants in mind <clears throat> i think I think, you know, the, the, in terms of upskilling, we look at the, the organisation's ability to be data driven. And I think this is really central to that. Um, and, you know, there's kind of four key areas about data driven social housing organisations. So you've got um, a kind of people, platforms, performance and processes. In terms of people, you know, do you have um, people with um, ability to, to be a model? Um, do you need to outsource that? Or is that something in terms of training you, you want to do? I know. The BIM for Housing Association toolkit gives real good foundational steps to do that, and I know some organisations are starting there and upskilling their staff through that and, and some training as well. Um, I think in terms of data analysts, do you need data analysts to be part of that or to, to understand the outcomes of it, um, or, or is this something you want to use? You know, organisations like um, like Twinder to, to to take some of that kind of heavy lifting for you. Um, there's a platform, that, and I think I spoke earlier. Actually, just now, current provisions on some of the asset management softwares, that software that housing associations use, um, aren't necessarily fit for purpose and don't provide the space to, to collect a lot of the, the, the kind of more granular details that you would really need. Um, and I think that's something as a sector um, we've done quite well for in the last two or three years, rather than just um, accepting what software is there, actually advocating as a sector to say, we, we need this and, and driving that forward. Some organisations are doing that themselves, building kind of dynamics modules um, on top of their, their asset data um, but I think having an interoperability between your housing management software your asset software um, and, and any kind of BIM modeling and, and, and digital twins is huge um, so I think that's something that we need to bear in mind it's not always about um, the end product it's about what what um, 
infrastructure we have internally to do that um, and having that built into a strategy, ensuring you've got a business case to say, actually, this is how much money we'll save because of the you know, things we mentioned in, in, in the last question, um, and this is how, you know, how we're going to get there. Um, in terms of performance, again, I think organisations have to have a real key eye on um, what performance metrics they currently collect about, business, about buildings, um, what a digital twin would enable them to do. Um, so you might think about, about energy efficiency, but also might be about um, the kind of fire safety. And, and I know that some examples in the sector that have been done already. And I think about, you know, do, do we currently collect enough data about that? Particularly in, uh, environmental data, we're still kind of foundationally moving towards that. We've done some work um, in terms of UK housing data standard to standardise environmental and ESG um, data. And it's still, I would say, um, really um, emerging for some some housing associations and having a better understanding of what the what a di digital twin would enable you to do helps you to, to, mm -hmm. to build that that bigger picture but again ensuring you're using consistent terms that could be benchmarked against other organizations across the sector um, and internally through your different departments um, and i think that the last kind of key point to, to ensure that organizations have um, in terms of that kind of skills and culture piece um, is having that understanding of the data flow and the processes you currently have so you know how do you collect data how do you update it what then does that go on to inform within an organization and um, is it data you're just collecting um for kpis for your for your for your um, exec team and board um, and i think this enables you to start doing a lot more than that so you're collecting data i think the um uk government's um white paper of um i was going to say last year but i think probably the tail end of the year before suggested that all data collected for, for social housing organisations should be transparent and insightful and I think having a digital twin um, is a driver to collect more data but you don't want to just do it just to collect a digital twin it's, it's about understanding then what potential data you know, usage you could have so the, the data, data collection data producer and the data user is all you know connected up in a kind of better data governance piece that enables you to, to make more assured and better and time-saving decisions and um, to enhance those those outcomes ensure you've got kind of safe and um, sustainable properties great thank you that's that was a really really insightful answer michael um you mentioned actually a few times there the the idea of it being emerging so let's let's um have a a quick conversation about uptake and the future of this tech um mm -hmm. catherine as somebody who is studying the development of this technology, how do you sort of see it evolving in the coming years? More accessible, more user friendly, wider features? What, what are your thoughts? Um, so, yeah, there are lots of different um, directions in which this could develop. And I think as we're already um, hearing in the discussion, one of the things that's going to, to drive it are these early um, use cases and how people are implementing their technology and what we're demanding um, from it. Um, and part of that, of course, is, is whose voices are heard, um, who, is, who is getting um, a say. Um, one of the interesting developments that we're seeing perhaps in other sectors um, um, is a move, particularly in manufacturing and complex product system sectors, a move from thinking about the particular asset um, in operation to thinking about the full life cycle. Um, of of the product or system um, that we're talking about. Um, so that's kind of beyond the operation um, focus. Um, so in the built environment um, setup, that's perhaps something that it would be great to see us take on um, a little bit earlier, if you like, to learn from their experiences um, and to move towards incorporating, designing, building, operating, and then also end of life um, considerations um, for buildings. Um, however, um, it is a different setting from kind of manufacturing um, and product settings. So um, we're talking even longer lifespans, um, which potentially means there's an opportunity to use um, this kind of looking at longer life um, and to have much more impact. But it also means that potentially we need to act faster because the buildings that are um, we're working with today are going to last into um, a lot longer kind of time scales and we're also talking about much more porous boundaries uh, in the built environment than we are um, when we're thinking about um, say a manufacturing facility where you've got much more control over how it operates and how um, people kind of interact with it um, but we also have this background of, of built of 
building information modeling um, that Mark mentioned, which is not the same as digital twinning as he said, but it does potentially provide us with um, a, a starting point or a kind of step forward in terms of um, digital twinning over the kind of over the longer term. Um, so that's an area that I'd like to see kind of developed, developed more. Um, and particularly then using that to link into thinking about decarbonization at this kind of relatively early stage in the implementation of um, of digital twinning in this sector. But um, it, as we've already been talking about data and, and data flows, um, it needs to be thought about um, as soon as possible, really, um, because the different types of data and the dips of type, different types of questions that you're going to ask um, are going to vary a lot, whether you're thinking about an operation, operation of an asset, or if you're thinking about designing and developing the next asset or reconfiguring a building um, to operate um, differently. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, Mark, I saw you nodding along to a few of Catherine's points there. What, what are your insights on this, on, on the future of digital twinning? Well, I think, I think um, both have, have, have said there's got to be a reason um, because if you're going to write a business case to say I want to create um, this all singing, all dancing digital version of my my um, physical reality, um, the board will probably go, "Great, that's a lovely idea. Thanks very much." There's got to be a, there's got to be that transitional uh, reason. So um, from you know in social housing and, and especially with the the, the, the higher risk and um, and high rise buildings, and that will increase over time. Um, is to, to to find that trojan horse okay um so building safety that is key at the moment um the building safety act um came about in late april this year uh, fire safety act before that there's a lot of um focus on bringing digital information about the physical properties of a building and all the information around that building to deliver the golden thread and to enable safety cases, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's the first thing. Social housing, you've got to do it. So you can either do it the traditional way, which is um, you know, go out with a, a tape measure and mark it up, create lots of little drawings and blah, blah, blah. Or you can actually go, well, let's let's sort of write, rewrite, you know, let's draw a line on what we used to do and let's do things moving forward. So, so you've got to go and capture your physical asset into a digital world, go and do that, create plans, create, bring all the information about building safety. Great. No, okay. So, what then can we do with that data? So, we've just addressed that, but we need to share that information with the residents so we can use that model to create infographics and um, VR walkthroughs and, and, and lots of different training scenarios that we can share, share with the residents. You know, this is how you use your building safety, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're now going into the next phase, which we, we're connecting IoT devices to the building. So, um, so we know the temperature, humidity, um, population counting, so we can count how many people are in the building at any one time and show that live in the digital twin. So there's not lots of little people walking around the building, but you'll see like heat spots of, of where people are. Um, that helps um, organisations understand how their building has been used and abused. Um, they might think there's only 500 people in that building, but there might be a thousand at any one point. Um, but we're now bringing, so we, and we've also brought a lot of asset information together to prove safety cases, et cetera, et cetera. So now we've got this really great ecosystem in a digital one single source of truth world where we've got building safety information, we've got live information that we're mining, um, and now we want to look at decarbonization. Okay, well, now we've got these two data sets, we can start doing that now. But if we'd have done the sort of go around with the tape measure and blah, 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 we wouldn't have gained that. So it's starting the journey um having that bit you know using um, in my my mind building safety in in the uh, in the social housing sector as that trojan horse but actually explaining that this isn't just a one trick pony this isn't just a one solution for this element and then we've got to go and work out something for decarbonization and then we've got to go and work out something for uh, resident engagement stuff and blah, blah blah fuse it all together you know have that journey put that map together put that plan together because you know it's not going to happen overnight, but it's got to start somewhere. So if you start somewhere with that plan and you go, okay, well, and, and that then makes it cost positive. It makes it so much better to be able to understand the fact that it might cost a little bit now, but over time we're going to use it for lots of other things as well and then grow and build on it. 
Um, but it, it's, it's having that initial plan, that initial foresight, and the, and the board members and directors that sign things off actually seeing it. Now, when they see it, because it's visual, and Michael says, you know, um, this is, it has to be visual. Um, it's not just a spreadsheet. It makes so much sense because they can see what they're actually going to get, how much value is going to be brought to the to the business um, from from not just the safety team but the asset team for the um, the financial team that's going to work out what's going to happen over time with their planning of uh, how their building is going to operate. How can they reduce the cost of operation? When uh, when when is the building? not a good idea anymore you know so um part of that whole financial plan so i think you just you sort of in, in your mind you just need to think of okay this is isn't just a great idea it's actually you start the journey with something that we need to do now when the next hot potato excuse the point is, is decarbonization so let's start that journey and i think that's the best way of being able to create that business case create that solution and grow the um, digital asset that you're creating that brings value to not just one element of a business, but brings it to the whole element of the business. And it becomes business as usual, as opposed to just a nice thing that some geeks have got in the corner. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, I can see that we've got a few questions in the chat. So we'll just uh, we'll just finish our more structured conversation in Michael. Um, from a user perspective, then, do you do you see the, the use of digital twinning becoming more prolific, um, something that's increasingly on building managers' radars? And I mean, do you see, foresee a time when it is, as, as Mark says, just kind of becomes business as usual, just standard practice? Yeah, I mean, and I, and I think Mark probably spoke to, to, to many of the points I, I, I would make in response to that. But I, th I think absolutely. So as a sector, um, I would say that, that we do loads and loads of, of, of great things and, and continue to do so. Um, we can often be very compliance driven. Um, and I think that's where, so culturally, you know, within organisations, people understand the benefits to using these things, but it's hard to get both that that um, exec team buy-in that you know the kind of those competing demands of of spend particularly you know, board level and decision you need to make that but actually in terms of just collecting some of that information and people understanding the benefits of doing that to then build technology on you know i, I think um some of these things are, are longer term approaches and issues for organizations i think when compliance like the building safety act which um as, as mark alluded to there that in, in that consultation closed on that in the middle of last month so we probably expect the secondary legislation for that any time now i think that's as a sector it gives us an opportunity to say well actually we will make all these changes we'll get all the benefits of of doing things better because we're going to do it um, for, for a very specific specific outcome that outcome being building safety for, for particularly for high risk buildings um, and I think that can then be the tipping point once you start to understand te new technologies you start to embed them within your organization the business case is easier to make when you start going well actually we want to start collecting data about new build developments rather than just purely for building safety of high risk buildings um, and again the, the other kind of area I would see this you know becoming standard practice or or supporting it becoming standard practice is the kind of interoperability of it with iot and i think both the guys mentioned that as part of that and i think um we see that people are collecting more and more kind of information about about um sustainability and about um, you know, retrofitting properties and their performance through iot so having that um, technologies that, that are interoperable having organizations who can who can um, understand manipulate and analyze different data sets and different technologies and um, again will support the, the more compliance driven stuff um, and help that um, and I think the World Economic Forum split IoT into kind of three sections so you've got your kind of consumer IoT so that your kind of smart devices um, and I think that's as we start to build out um, data sets from for social housing and and I think it has to be two, a two-way process and I think Mark alluded to that as well so visually be able to allow um, tenants to see that and actually see how does the, their behaviour and the performance of their building are affected by their use of different technologies. Um, I think the other IoT is the, the kind of building management again. So therefore, how can um, housing association or, or um, a local authority better use technologies to um, kind of influence the performance of that? So that might be where you control lighting or you control um, energy usage or, or um, you know, we are implementing kind of air source heat, heat pumps and understand the performance of that stuff um, and be able to measure that. Now, if 
tenants can see that and that, that kind of part of a, an ongoing resident engagement piece, um, I think it then starts to make this technology seem something that's not just geeks sitting in the corner again, or, or you know, or not, not just kind of future scaping, but actually these are real operational things. And the last part of that IoT is about, you know, smart cities. And I think for me, that's where, you, you know, I think you referred to something about, you know, seeing that being used in a, in a kind of standard practice. For new build developments, my visualisation of that is that, that someone sitting around the desk going, well, this is what this new build development looks like in, 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 in practice. Here's here's a digital twin of it. Um, so I think then it helps us look at a whole range of data sets. You know, so that might be you're looking at um, properties in the Midlands who have different different um, environmental um, issues than in the South, for example, or in, in, in Scotland where I am in terms of the kind of temperatures and actually I think having that built up you know, visually you can start to understand some of that the, the different implications of that um, and I think for a, for, a, for a full new build just looking at that and saying well look here's how the building safety here's the data we will keep through that life cycle of that building um, as per the, the building safety act but actually the, in terms of decarbonisation what's the performance of that building what's the sustainability of the life cycle of that data um, and I, th I think I think for me I see that being a, a kind of you know, I was going to say five, ten years time. Some organisations are doing that now, um, and we see emerging technologies. I would say emerging that application of the technology, but there are some organisations who are absolutely doing that right now. Um, and I would suggest that that once we've got a couple of more um, kind of legislative drivers to that, as in here's a real answer to some of the building safety challenges, is having this data that we've got for a a, a, a BIM model or your know, digital twins. Then I think that would become commonplace. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. Um, actually, what, what you've said this sort of alludes to a number of the questions that we've got in the chat. So we'll, we'll move on to audience questions now. Um, and yeah, one of them, you, you've mentioned residents, Michael. How how involved do they need to be in the rollout of something like this? So I would say, um, how involved do, do they need to be? So to do it properly, to, to have a good practice to ensure that, that you're collecting good, up-to-date, accurate data that's making a difference to their life, then I think they have to be involved. I think I think it's part of that wider resident engagement piece. Um, social housing organisations have the opportunity as, you know, particularly the kind of place-based approach to, 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 to do that. I think we will look at new technology being implemented and, and are we collecting new lots of information for any kind of data protection impact assessment that people are making for that, for new new data and understand we should be bringing the, the tenants on that journey so yes in terms of gdpr data protection act um, we're able to collect this information about the building which actually starts to help us build up a picture of the life and behavior of the people within that but in terms of ethically what you know you should if you're going to collect information that's telling you about their lives they definitely should be involved in that and i know some organizations are looking at data trusts to help you know groups of tenants better understand the application of new technologies and i think this definitely plays a role in that so i think um if, if you want to do this right you want to embed it within how your organization make decisions and um, then then without doubt you do need to do that how you do it you do it by being very transparent very open about it um my uh, advice would be starting off small scale projects and having the prop the, the organic the residents from those properties involved certainly keeping them, them up to date with actually what is the technology what's going to be used for what it means to their life um and what the, um, I suppose, future uses of that will be. And I think for me, in terms of that data ethics piece, again, that's why it's important. So have an understanding of how your data is going to be used, what decisions it's going to affect, rather than just purely, we're collecting this to make a, a, a um, you know, vi visual representation digitally of your homes. But actually, if it starts to build up a picture about um, fuel poverty, for example, because of the type of data you're collecting in your building, actually, how are you going to use that to support those tenants? And I think at that point, if you have informed the tenants, if they've been part of that journey and understand what data you're collecting and potential usage, it makes that a lot easier. They become more comfortable. It doesn't seem like Big Brother building, you know, a visual representation of their house with them doing their dishes at the window. You know, it's, it's more about um, having a holistic understanding of the interoperability of um, customer data and asset data. So, so I do think it's huge, and I think it's something that that um, as, as this does become commonplace, we just spoken about. Um, I think that the approach around that will evolve. But I think they will involve real good resident engagement. Great. Okay, um, we've got a, a, another good question here. Um, how has or can digital twinning be used in conjunction with the rollout of on-site renewables? 
can it help to model the best solution for a building? Um, who, who's who got some thoughts on this? Maybe Mark? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it can, because um, if you've already got a, a digital representation of the building, um, as I said earlier, we can then analyze, uh, we can put, say for instance, so Google, um, I've done a thing called the Google Gold, um, Golden uh, Golden Roof Project, uh, where they, they tell you where the best place to put a solar panel is, depending on the sun position and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then if you put uh, a representation of that and, and simulated exactly how that um, that was going to work, you'd be able to analyze whether that was the best solution for you or uh, a heat pump was the best solution or you need a communal heating system and how would that work and how would that pass through. So um, having that digital version of the truth um, allows us, enables people to be able to play as well. Um, so um, instead of going and going, right, okay, we're going to have that solu that solar system because I really like that sales guy and um, that heat pump because she's really nice and she told, sold me a dream, put it in, it doesn't work, and then you're two million pounds down the road and you, and you haven't analysed it. So sitting back and being able to analyse the, the different scenarios um, is key. Again, just things like, you know, forgetting any... Um, things that you implement on a building if you've got um four sides to a building and most of it's glass um which side's getting hotter which side keeps in the cool how does it work over time um so if you've got a communal heating system all the people on the top floor aren't sweating even though they're in the middle of the the, the uh, winter we can simulate all of these things um to to, to make sure that um the, the end solution is, is right and that might sound expensive but comparative to getting it wrong it's, it's a drop in the ocean. Yeah, so presumably, as somebody in the chat has mentioned, that, that using digital twinning tech will actually lead to better outcomes in this respect. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. And and speed up time, because um, you know, if, if you've already got that model, um, we can jump straight into it. We can put whatever we need to do into that model and then and, and analyse it. And things like, you know, people like people movement and things like that as well, you know, We've got systems we can put different demographics of people in and they can walk through the building and we can see how, how quick they'll exit the building and what um, what normal uh, you know, humans would do to get out of a building and all those sort of things. We can, we can do lots of analysis and that sounds very sort of lab and expensive and tech, but it's not. It's you know, Once you've got that asset, you can do lots of with it. And um, I'm sure from the academic point of view, you'll agree as well. OK, so we're now looking at how, how housing associations or I suppose any any building manager really can can actually get started with this. And, and Catherine, you mentioned quite a few times the importance of, of data in this respect. So the question here is, is, is making sure data is in good condition. Is that the first step to getting started with this technology? I would say so, yes, um, but it's, it is more than um, kind of the condition of existing data flows it's, it's also about what is it you're measuring and how are you going to use that so it's about the appropriateness of the of the data and it's interesting hearing um mark talk about the kind of redeveloping of a digital twin so you start with one problem or one area and then um you know you can reapply a lot of that but also in hearing him talk about it you can also hear that there is a kind of reassessment or a revisiting of the digital twin with each problem so you're sort of thinking about what are the additional data sources of the additional questions that i need i need to ask and also going back to the original data and saying you know is this still um appropriate for the for the questions um i'm going to ask so yes data and um appropriateness and quality of data are really important there's also the issue of sharing data um, which we've touched upon um, and the governance of that is going to become more and more um, important um, especially where you're working across buildings and in kind of a wider um, environment um, so yes our data governance processes are needing to um, to keep up with the ambition and the ideas I think of us kind of wanting to redevelop redevelop the Mark, Michael do you have anything to add to that Absolutely. I suppose for, for us, it's the kind of work that we are currently doing in the sector, um, be that for for um, uh, digital twins or for um, kind of new approaches and innovative ways of working. I think having it underpinned by that kind of solid foundation. And I think Catherine says it's right. It's not about 
just what data you currently have. Actually, the work we're doing with a couple of the, the, the kind of um, larger organisations, G15 just now, um, is about specifically on their asset data. But you know, doing that that mapping of what data do you currently have, um, what kind of what assessment do you have of it in terms of um, integrity, quality, or missing data, um, almost as a kind of audit, and then have that to be. So what what is it you need your data to be doing and, and mapping that against the, the UK housing data standards, which um, HAC produced and, and remain free to download for, for all housing associations, um, is a really, really good foundational step to do that. Um, the development handover standard, for example, which was kind of um, some of the foundational steps behind the, the golden thread um, is where we map, would map that. And, and I think that it really helps us to go, we've got a, a working um, data model. We know, you know what data we need to, to flow into that, but actually it helps us understand how interoperable the data we have within our organisation and externally for, for benchmarking. I think that's huge and it means you can start um, innovating um, in Different types of technology, but with the same data sets, um, and I think I think that's huge, and it's something that that we are, you know, real strong advocates for. I think having a, a data standard is, is probably foundational. It's it, it's you know the reason we created that was because um, the sector were, were, were telling us, um, and what we also did with Microsoft suggested that the, the quality and consistency of data across social housing um, wasn't quite w w what it needed to be, um, and by building a full data model, which we have now done, um, it, it starts to enable us to, to see where the gaps are um, and what we need to get to. But I think having a having a real, real sense of kind of almost your audit internally, and I think I go back to the, the, the white paper where it said all data you have has to be transparent and insightful. I think without knowing what data you need and what data you have, um, it, it doesn't allow us to do that. And I think it suggests that you either um, only collect the data you need or you use all the data you have. And I think some organisations are at a point where they're probably not sure what, what line of those to take. Um, and I think that's where we're having a, a data model, like data standards to follow, um, or you know, using the, the BIM for Housing Association's toolkit, um, are real good foundational steps to help people start thinking about these things and getting better, better data governance across the piece. Great, okay. We just had a, another question just slip in quite quickly here from um, Elliot. Digital twin tech and traditional BMS, building management systems. Can you recap how these two solutions interact? Um, and who'd ever like to take this question? Um, if we could be concise, because I'm mindful we've only got five minutes left. I can jump in if you want. So, Great, thanks, um, so, so um, the BMS systems can feed information live about what's happening with the building over time. So along, we can map that into the building, uh, the digital twin of the building, to see how that how the building is um, working efficiently. Um, so if if a lot of organisations, especially in housing, don't have BMS, so we have to put IoT systems in. Um, but if you have BMS as well, um, and then also live information about what the gas usage and electric usage and blah 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 is, we can then bring that into the model and analyse it as well. Great. And actually, another one, uh, Fee Mark, very briefly, a question from Dehman says, please may I ask, what is the name of the hospital in Birmingham? I believe you referenced earlier. Um, it was the um, Midland Metro, uh, Midland Met is the, the big one in Samuel. Great. The, the one that was on the telly when Carillion went bump and then um, somebody ended up, ended up having to do it. So they're still building it now. Fab. Okay, well, look, that's basically all the time that we have for uh, today, unfortunately. But thanks everyone for joining, and especially to you guys, to our speakers, for your really, you know, really useful insight on this um, on this emerging technology. Uh, the website, will, uh, the webinar will be available to view shortly on the Elemental website. And if you're not already following us, please um, do give us a follow on LinkedIn. We are Elemental UK. Um, for all of our latest updates. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, and have a lovely day.